Hi everyone, this is Marina Chapelsky with Jacob Tenenbaum in our weekly Legal Status with Marina Chapelsky show, doing our English language version today, prepared for attacks by my Trump supporting friends, because I'm very happy this week about all the executive orders signed by Biden. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get into this. First of all, thank you uh, for joining us. Thank you very much. We've been keeping up our promises. Uh, we're doing our weekly show. And today we decided this week uh, it'll be a little bit different. Uh, we will go over everything about immigration that was done so far by the new administration and what was canceled out, uh, what latest Trump, you know, what, what happened in Trump's final days, his last burst of immigration restrictions, how it was canceled out and what to expect. That would be the first part. And the second part, even Marion doesn't know about it. This week, compared to the previous week, when previous week, a lot of people were taking their time, they were holding, they were thinking that the reform is going to come literally tomorrow and you don't have to do anything because you're going to be legal. So this part passed and this fine. So the second part, we're going to talk about the refugees because the amount of calls about the refugees from all the different countries, Russia, Ukraine, uh, Armenia with their Hubert John, was tremendous this week tremendous and the people don't know what to do how can we help them and so on but let's start from the first thing uh, uh, I'll, I'll read you a little bit i prepared a little piece of, just to read you uh, and you'll just give me your opinion and we'll go over it as many as we can so um the trump administration has implemented dozens of final immigration regulation over the last of over the last couple of days in the office his restrictive immigration policies have been a hallmark of his presidency, like literally the main thing. Uh, question to you, what do you think about it and how he's going to undo it and uh, what is happening there? So the good news is a lot of things that were drafted and attempted to make into laws didn't make it. So even though uh, before leaving, Trump and his administration tried to make all kinds of new restrictions and made them into drafting, it didn't make it into final versions. And some things that were done and approved as final versions were undone immediately. So a lot of things didn't uh, have uh, like a positive response from the public, which sometimes didn't bother the Trump administration before. But like, I, I forget now, but there's like one major rule that uh, they tried to push through and because the public strongly disapproved and the attorneys and all the immigration advocates, it didn't make it through. So the good news is it could have been worse. <laughs> I'll put it this way. <laughs> it could have been worse. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, during the Trump administration, over 400 restrictions on immigration on uh, an executive level were made. Over 400. Obama, during two terms, couldn't even come close to making this many changes. And it was obvious that it was like an obsessive idea for Trump and for whoever he picked. And there, there were few people who were never really approved as the heads of DHS, but were like acting secretaries mm -hmm. of DHS. Uh, they didn't get approved by Congress. Uh, definitely were obsessing and made it into like this goal of restricting legal immigration. And again, I want to make it clear, legal immigration was restricted, not illegal. Like people think, oh, I hate illegals. They should be shot at the border. This is not about illegal. This was about people who are filing for immigration, providing their information, providing their criminal clearances, asking to come here legally, Everything is on the up and up, but certain categories of people under Trump became restricted from coming, starting with the travel bans, right? Some of them were like religious based, yeah. to, um, which I'm going to talk about later today. The refugee cap, right, that we had during Trump was historically the lowest ever in the history of the United States before COVID even. Forget about COVID. I get under COVID why people are against the refugees. Although generally I don't get it, but before COVID already, it was reduced from a hundred thousand, or in the in the past, on one hundred twenty-five thousand. Again, in a country of three hundred twenty-eight plus 
millions of people, we have a refugee cap of 100,000, Trump decreased it to 18,000, and then to 15. So I, I, I want people to understand what we're talking about. Over the years, under you know Bush and Reagan and so on, we had about 100,000 a year as a normal thing. It 85%, 85%. And again, I'm here as a refugee. I'm here and you're here because I received the legal status of refugee. I will never speak against the refugee resettlement program. Even if you just, you know, if you put a gun in, in my head and said, either we shoot you or you say something negative about the refugee program, I will never do it because I don't separate myself. I'm no more special just because I came here at a younger age and there was a special law, of course, for the Russian Jews, there was the Jackson Vanek Amendment. So because by the grace of the Jews who were here before us, we stand on their shoulders, we were able to come here. It doesn't make me any more special than the Mexican people or people from El Salvador who are like dying and they're not coming here because they're having such a wonderful life in their country and they just want to make more money. Yeah. They're coming because they're living in terrible conditions. So it doesn't make me any more special, you know? And yes, uh, so I think much. it's a good thing. Wonderful. I want to jump to the next question. It's uh, please listen to me, what I'm going to read to you. So pre uh, President Joe Biden unveiled a sweeping immigration plan short of the take in office. That include a pathway to citizenship to the millions and millions of undocumented immigrants in the country and eliminating lengthy green card wait time. Under the new plan, and it's just a plan for now, those living in the United States as of January 1st, of this year could apply for temporary protective status immediately, followed by a green card after five years if they meet certain requirements, such as paying taxes, passing a ground check, and so, on and so forth. They would be allowed, to, and they would be allowed to apply for the citizenship within three years as the wives and husbands of the married couple. Mm -hmm. The nation mm -hmm. dreamers who's entered the country unlawfully as children dreamers, as well as those in the country under the temporary protective status. CPS and some agricultural workers could also apply for green card immediately. I need your explanation because a lot of people so, are asking okay. about it. Okay, so so the first thing that Biden spoke about is the promise he made during the elections. He said, "If I get elected, I'm really going to do my best pushing through this immigration amnesty." Now. Biden has experience pushing through laws in Congress. I want to make this very clear Bala. for people who don't like to get involved into the little uh, you know, intricacies of the US political system. Big laws are made by the US Congress. US Congress, not the president makes laws, but the US Congress. So Biden used to be a senator and he has experience being on committees and leading committees creating laws legally the way they're supposed to through the Congress. Okay, so he says, as soon as I become president, I'm gonna push through, I'm not gonna make the law. I'm gonna ask Congress to pass the law legalizing immigrants according to the criteria that you just read. Of course, in the first line are kids that uh, were brought here you know, without status, who grew up here, who speak English without an accent, even better than me. And, you know, they're Americans for all intents and purposes, but they don't have a social, they don't have any documents, their passport is expired, they have no legal status. Okay, now, he says, I'm going to push this law through Congress. He didn't pass the law, the law didn't pass Congress. They're discussing it as a suggestion right now, and there's began work already on this. I understand there's seven Congress people who are working on it, like a mini committee. Biden in the past, to 27 years ago, is the one responsible for the VAWA law, right? He and another senator sponsored a big law about VAWA that helped women and men who are victims of domestic violence get certain benefits, including immigration benefits, not just the immigration benefits. But because of him, women and men feel much safer today. And everybody agrees it's a good thing for us socially. Just like that, he wants to push through Congress a law that takes all these people, many of them who are here illegally have no status, but they're not criminals. You know, they didn't kill anybody. 
they pay taxes they're trying to work they want to work legally they want to pay taxes they want to participate in our economy and help and do the jobs that many americans will never do no matter what you do to them people who are american would be on welfare and they will not go in the fields and do agricultural jobs or work at those meat plants or wash dishes for three dollars an hour in new york city i'm sorry if i say something that you know you don't agree with but this I'm is totally fact. okay this is fact so you can fight so now this law would legalize those people this law does not mean open borders this law doesn't mean let everybody in even the terrorists this law doesn't mean that people with criminal, serious criminal records would get in. None of that. I haven't said anything about it. And what you read to me says nothing about it. Open yeah. borders is something else. Police, people who are big Trump supporters and big conservatives confuse the two or are on purpose confuse the two. They specifically say amnesty equals open borders. It doesn't mean people are going to now rush our borders to get in. This is for people who've been here for 30 years and we know some of them, right? You, you met them, yeah. you know, and they still don't have it. Okay, it hasn't passed. Stop calling us for now, asking if it, if it passed. You're gonna keep with the news. When <laughs> and if it passes, we'll see, because we have 49% Republicans in the Congress, just like there's 51 approximately percent Democrats. They have a lot to say about it. They're completely against it. This may never pass, but it's a good political, uh, topic to be discussed right now and yeah. I'm very much in favor of this law passing and not just because I'm a lawyer and it's going to make me money in fact I make more money legalizing people who have no other way of legalizing just think about that I make 12,000 on something where it's impossible and other lawyers can never fix it so now somebody who has an amnesty and I have to fill out some forms I can never charge the 12,000 you understand so it's a ridiculous thing when people tell me oh you're an immigration lawyer you're going to gain from this how am I going to gain from this you know, so yeah. just letting you know that I really believe in this law, and even though this might be against my financial interests. Okay, thank you, Marish. I'm uh, right now. Just listen to me again. Um, this is something that happened last Tuesday, literally three days ago. President uh, uh, signed three executive orders on Tuesday to roll back Trump era regulation restricting legal immigration and to reunite families separated at the U.S.-Mexican border. Uh, one directive orders agency to do a top to bottom review, a total, a full review of recent regulation policies and guidelines that have set up barriers to our legal immigration system. Agency will need to submit any suggested changes and step uh, uh, already taken within 60 days. So by April 2nd, we'll know what they're going to go okay. with. Another uh, order established. Yes, the there's three executive orders. You're reading yeah, them. Just read it three. Another order is let, let me quickly talk about this one. It All doesn't right. have much to do with like our Russian speaking community, for example, but this has to do with uh, Latin American uh, migrants, you know, people who asked for asylum. And the Trump administration made the zero tolerance policy and basically separated kids from parents. And there's 5,500 families that are documented who have separated from their kids. So the parents can't find the kids and the kids are too small, don't speak English and can't find the parents. So this is such a humanitarian crisis that he had to make an executive order just to fix this issue, okay? Parents have to be united with kids, illegal or legal, doesn't matter. Families should not, we're not Nazis. And there's other things that are happening in the camps, in the detainment camps that people don't even know about and don't care to know about. But and because of my profession and what I read and what I hear, what I see, there's terrible things like uh, women being forced to be by force sterilized, have their uh, uterus and ovaries removed in detention because they didn't want them getting pregnant because of people raping them in detention. This is insane what's happening. And the fact that people are like so cold hearted about it just because they're illegal makes me really question about our fellow men here, uh, the people we live with, our neighbors, you know, who live right next to us here. Thank you, Marish. I mean, I'm totally sharing with you all those concerns because we've seen, I've mean, only been here a little over a year, but they are already communicating with the jail, knowing what's happening with the people. And you personally, you, you got out so many people out of jail and they coming here in the office with flowers, with cakes, crying, telling the stories of horror. And uh, yeah. Second, uh, 
Second point, another order establishes a government task force to reunite the more than 5,000 families separated at the border under Trump 2008 zero tolerance policy. Alejandro Mayorka, our new uh, our Homeland Security chief, the new, uh, uh, he is leading this tech for, tech force. You just mentioned that. And the last one, the third order, mandates a review of Trump policy limiting asylum and commits to developing a certain strategy, a strategy, a plan to manage migrants across Central America. So all those caravans that are going to be happening, somehow we're going to look at it from the point of establishing how they actually uh, got yeah. organized and how they get here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, first of all, uh, the, the, I, I know that there was a lot of people who were at the border from Honduras and so on. They got turned away for now, because for now we haven't established the new laws about this and the executive order was just signed this week. So this executive order, first of all, another big piece of news that's related to this executive order is that the Senate confirmed, we've been talking about Alejandro Mayorkas, right? We've been yeah. talking about our new Secretary of DHS, but he wasn't officially confirmed by the U.S. Congress until this week on Tuesday, I think he was confirmed. So he's confirmed as a permanent for now, not a temporary, not an acting, but a permanent uh, Secretary of Department of Homeland Security, a guy who worked under Obama, a guy who's an immigrant, a guy who is uh, a Latino. So all good things, a smart guy, it used to be a, pers um, a, persecu a prosecutor, not persecutor, Jew prosecutor. Jewish too, too. And a somehow you just really like Cuban and Romanian immigrants, yeah. Right, so uh, he will be leading a new uh, kind of, I guess like a new agency that's going to take in people from different government agencies and review immigration laws and be kind of the advisors to the president about whether certain laws should be changed or not. You know, especially the changes that were made under Trump, but beyond that, even before Trump, there were a lot of things that didn't make sense and weren't humane. And I can see the writing on the wall here that, yes, despite the fact that we have COVID, Despite the fact that there's unemployment and small businesses are dying, which is a whole different ball game, and I can talk about it too, but not today probably. Despite all that, we are still going to be humanitarian. We are going to be a country that has capitalism, but will treat people right. And that doesn't make us communist, okay? Because there's so many European nations that have excellent social systems, they have capitalism. Yes, they probably pay more taxes than we do, and we don't like that, and I don't want to pay more taxes either. But generally speaking, we want to be a country that treats people right, and we're a country of immigrants. So that's that's the theme I'm seeing in what Biden is doing, holding promises and do, being humanitarian with the immigration laws. Uh, this, this, uh, hopefully this agency will fix the backlogs with asylum. We have people who filed in like 2015, 2016, still have not had an asylum interview, not even talking about courts or anything. So this second executive order is saying, look, we're going to have people look into it who will try to fix the laws the right way. Thank you, Marius. Thank you very much. Another question, just a just little bit. Uh, what do you think about uh, public charge rule cancellation? Public I said charge rule. In six, 60 um, days, there is a good possibility it can be canceled. You mean you mean the self-sufficiency forms that came about the public charge rule? Public charge, yeah. Yeah, I think the public charge rules generally, even before all this, were a good idea. I'll be honest with you. I think if you are filing for your family members, you're bringing people in here. We don't want them in welfare, and we don't want them getting free insurance. I'm with that idea. I agree with that. Okay. However, to make it so difficult for the immigrant to prove self-sufficiency of self-sufficiency when they haven't even come here yet uh, and the form is so complicated that even lawyers are getting requests for evidence right and left and I am in many groups so you can believe me when I say this uh, the, even lawyers don't know how to deal with these forms and the you know the officers of USCIS have no idea how to deal with these like what how, how many pages like 28 pages or something form it's it's ridiculous yes. <laughs> there's questions that are double negatives and run on sentences in there so it's definitely for meant to fail uh, the immigrant it's not a form that's meant to help anybody prove self-sufficiency 
and uh, getting them to give credit reports and IRS transcripts and all this bullshit is just it just makes no sense. I'm against that. But I do believe in the public charge rules. I don't think they should do away with public charge rules generally. I think they will they will do away with it because um, I'm talking about the uh, form I-944 and the DS form 55440. I think they're going to get rid of it because the federal courts already three times went back and forth on it. So I think it's going to go away. I have some questions here by Jamie, who is a mm -hmm. great follower of ours. Good morning. And he asks here, we had executive order by Trump administration when person can't get political asylum if person had criminal charges in home country. Is this law still due? Thank you. Uh, that was the law even before um, the, the executive order by Trump. That's not what was the executive order under Trump. Under Trump, they said if you travel through a third country, you have to stay in Mexico and prove that you have a real fear of returning because you could have asked for asylum in the third country. Like if you had a ticket through Turkey, like you know many people do, or through UK. You didn't come straight to New York. You went through UK and you had a layover one night or something like that. Uh, the law that says people who have criminal charges in their country has been around for a long time. It, Trump didn't come up with that. But that's still in place about the third country. And people are hoping that, uh, that Biden will do away with it because it created tremendous uh, delays at the Mexican border for people legally asking for asylum. They're like pretty much just living in Mexico now in terrible conditions. So they're just like stick in Mexico doesn't want these people there either. So I think they're going to fix it. Then he has another question. Second mm -hmm. question, do you think that the new administration will bring back old forms for USCIS? No, I don't. Because under Trump administration, all forms were updated with new questions and requirements. You know what? I think the Biden administration will keep some of the Trump changes. I think that they will decide to keep them. I don't think old forms are coming back, but maybe they'll change the forms and make them a little more humane, maybe. And the final question is, Fresh from the garden, Biden administration, CBP revised catch and release policy at the border amid COVID concerns. We'll see. I know that that you know. So what is this? People don't even know these catch phrases, right? Catch and release means this: people who are not asking for asylum, they're just trying to squeeze through and cross the border illegally. They used to catch them, put them in jail, and then you know, like deport them and then send them back. Catch and release means they catch them, but then they release them, and then they try to come back like the next day. Do I think that um, that's going to get revived? I don't know. I didn't see anything about this officially being declared, so I'm not sure about what's going to happen. But uh, chances are they're going to do something about you know all these people coming in illegally. First of all, not asking for, just trying to sneak through, sneak in yeah um, I'm not sure what they're gonna do with them they're not gonna separate families anymore that's for sure so we'll see also if I can if I may add so it says here that under rules put by in place by US Center for Disease Control during the current pandemic most immigrants arriving in the border are now immediately expelled and by the way Biden's team has not pledged to reverse this policy right away so this yeah. is yeah. I don't know what they're talking about, uh, Jamie, mm -hmm. but he yeah. hasn't said anything about this yet. So we'll see, yeah. you know, things are still developing. Who knows when we speak next week, something else will come up. But I do see that they're trying to do this the right way by like, you know, wisely. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Cause I, um, Another question, there's something, as I told you already, the first uh, week after, you know, he took the office, it was very hard. It was a lot of questions about uh, what's going to happen. Should I do something now? Will I be part of it? This week, it's all about refugees. So Biden has also said that he would raise the cap for refugees uh, resettling the United States from abroad to 125,000 from the historic low 15,000 set by Trump this year. It's never been that low. Question for you. The calls that I'm getting, like, for example, this morning, I got a call from an Armenian guy whose family went through hell with Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. What can they do? How can they help? How can they prepare right away? Uh, please give the instructions. 
So uh, I spoke a little bit about this early in the show. As I said, I wrote a big article. You know, I invite you to join me and s subscribe and follow me personally on Facebook. And I always post all these articles on our um, law office pages. But um, there's been studies and data released by the Department of State. And uh, basically, over the years, the amount of refugees has been around the 100,000 a year, even under, like, I, as I mentioned, under other presidents, Bush, Reagan, uh, Clinton, Obama. Obama allowed 90,000 in during the one term of his administration. And so, uh, you know, th these are the numbers that normally we had. In America, that has 328 million of people, population, right? So there was, like, this experiment where this professor in college took, took a big glass jar and then he put like these big balls there and he said, okay, this is 328 million, right? So he put in these balls and he showed 328 balls of like different colors. This is the population of the United States. And then he added 120,000 of little tiny candies, like tiny little candies. He added 120. He showed how little that is on the backdrop of 328 million and people born and dying every year, you know? So historically we've been a country of refugees. Refugees usually, now I'm not talking about asylum, I'm talking about refugees. The, uh, immigration law separates that into two categories. There's asylum and refugees. Asylum is when somebody is already in the United States and asks to be uh, given asylum, like to, you know, please protect me, give me asylum. This is refugees. Refugees are coming in either through the U.S. consulates, you can ask for a refugee status in the U.S. Consulate, you can file an application, or people come straight to the border and ask to be uh, classified as a refugee because maybe they're from El Salvador where there's gangs and stuff. Maybe mm -hmm. they're from some other country that's going, like Armenia, that's going uh, through pretty much genocide in their country right now. So they ask for that refugee status. Um, what do I think? I think they're allowing more people in. So if you have proof and you, you have um, you know, you can prove that you're a refugee from your country, you're suffering from genocide, you probably can try to come to the U.S. border. However, because of COVID, I think at this time, as you just mentioned, they're turning a lot of people away. So yeah. even though it was just signed today, this executive order, I don't know when people are going to be able to just come and ask for refugee status to satisfy the quota. You know what I mean? Like, I still Madisha, don't I know. Focus. I want to focus, can, there is a concrete example, a, a family in Armenia who went through the hell of the Nagorno-Karabakh war, and they hearing that right now it's, it, it went up, a quote went up from 15,000 to 150,000. They do not have any relatives in the United States, all the relatives and friends. What can they do right now? Can we help They can them? file for refugee status at the U.S. Uh, consulate in their country. They can, can we help him? Can we help um, him doing that? I usually don't. I usually send people to organizations abroad, like HIAS, for example. Mm -hmm. They handle the refugee resettlement. There's organizations that help them. I don't. I don't have experience. I don't like to do things that I don't know how to do well. So I don't have experience with refugee stuff. But people who are here, I, we do very well with asylum. So we are still filing. We just filed a couple of cases this week. Uh, for LGBT, for oh, we are filing a lot of the Russian opposition cases now for people. Yes, I was, I was asking, I, I wanted to ask uh, you about no. it, but it's an English show. But but there we, we we have a lot of Russian English speakers who listen to us. So yes, please talk about it because yeah, okay, sorry. So because of you know, I, I you know I read in both languages, right? So I follow people on Instagram and Facebook in both languages. I follow this Russian writer. That Jacob personally knows and uh, doesn't have the best feelings about. His name is Alexander Tipkin. He wrote today an article about uh, America and Russia and what they're going through. And he said, look, America doesn't want Russia to be going through hard times right now because they have their own problems to worry about, the new president and so on. Uh, you know, if uh, there's too much unrest here, they're going to help Putin rather than the opposition because right now they don't need uh, things to be, you know, rock the boat. They, they, you know, this is his opinion, of course. And I responded and I said, I kind of agree with you, by the way, 
but then he said at the end of his post that he thinks Americans are watching what's going on in Russia like a show, <laughs> like a like a Netflix show. And I said I disagree. I think Americans don't give that much of a shit about Russia, to be honest with you. And I'm not talking about Russian speaking people. I'm talking about just people who live like in Kentucky or Illinois or Iowa. They don't know about Russia and they don't care what happens in Russia. They do care about what happens with refugees here and taxes and COVID and all that. So I said to him, uh, you know, that I disagree with that part of what he said. But I think that right now for anybody who is from Russia or Belarus and who has, I think it's a change of circumstance because things were bad, but they were kind of stable in Russia until like now. Right now, because of what Navalny is doing, people are going out there and protesting and blogging and writing on Facebook and writing on Instagram and expressing their opinions and joining opposition organizations in the United States and going to take, you know, to do protests in front of the Russian embassy. By the way, the Russian embassy yesterday uh, complained that they, somebody threw paint at them. There's been so many protests in front of the Russian embassy in New York that they asked the police for protection. They asked for New York City and YPD to give them protection, which has never happened before. You know, they oh, had their it's, happened, it's happened in 19, it's happened all from 1975 to 1989 because they yeah, had millions. Not lately. Not lately. Yeah, not lately. Yeah, they, they had a million oh. Jews demonstration with a slogan, let my people go. And this is one of the reasons we're here. So I think that actually, if you're from Russia and you're here illegally and you are here more than a year, but you are definitely supporting the protest, now is a good time to file for asylum because, you know, you really you have nothing to lose either you're going to win asylum or i think biden will push through some sort of a change in congress so then in the process of asylum you can probably end up legalizing through some new uh amnesty reform that will be coming i hope okay it hasn't come yet i don't want people start calling me today and saying when they can find but i think asylum is a good idea right now a couple more From questions please Okay, so the new administration pledges to immediately hold construction of the U.S.-Mexican border wall, which Trump uh, threw as a major accomplishment during uh, Texas visit just days before leaving office. It is not entirely clear, however, what the new administration will do with the contracts for wall construction that have already been awarded but have yet to be completed. Uh, and the money were already paid over the private land seized by the government in places where a building has stopped. Uh, what do you think is going to happen there? <laughs> uh, they I, paid I, money. I, they paid money. To well, the yeah, government. because Trump was rushing this through. He was pushing. First of all, I think they got money from the military budget, right? And the Congress was very much partially, against Partially, partially, yeah. Yeah, so some of the money came from our military budget budget which is pretty big our military budget and uh the money was used for this wall the wall is very symbolic but it's not very effective <laughs> okay uh the, the, again this is my opinion i know many people who live in california and texas have posted on my page and disagreed with me when i expressed it so perhaps i don't have all the information i, I never claim the smartest person on earth but it doesn't seem like it's very effective because people are not just like going in, you know, legally just like, you know, going in, you know, without any fear. They go through tunnels, they go through rivers, they go at night, they go in trucks and in buses. You know, the wall might stop some people, you know, but um, I don't think people get the, like, in Russian it's mashtab. Uh, the, the scale, the scale of how many thousands the size, are coming the in. Magnitude. I think it's a good idea to protect our borders. Okay, I do. I think our borders should be protected. I don't think anybody should be sneaking in, especially because I worry just like all the other Americans about terrorists and criminals. And the gangs, the Mexican gangs open openly use the border like a revolving door. They come in and out with whatever they want. So don't tell me that this is like a new problem that the wall is going to fix. However, I don't know what they're going to do with already having paid contractors, already having bought land from people, you know, buy them in a domain and paying them something for it. Right? 
I don't know what's going to happen. I have a feeling they're going to keep that land and maybe they'll just put like, you know, border patrol officers there to patrol that area, which I think it's the right thing to do, put cameras in and all this other stuff. I don't know if the wall is necessarily a solution, you know. Rachel, um, final question about those uh, reviewing the policies. Uh, this week also unusual. I noticed the second after refugees, I got three calls from pretty relatively young people. Uh, most of them, one from Pakistan, two from uh, uh, I don't know, Mexico or Nicaragua or Salvador, asking the question, so is DACA working? And I came here at three years old. And uh, what should I do right now? Like, practically, what can I do? How can I do it? How can I apply? Uh, DACA is absolutely working, and what blows me away is that it was uh, under, you know, it was around for at least four or five years. They accepted everybody who applied. Now, many people got denied. We had a couple of people who were denied, actually, even though they were completely 100% eligible. But um, even I was talking to this asylum officer because the person who was denied ended up filing for asylum because he was denied for DACA. So I was talking to the asylum officer and she said that like this particular, I think California service center was just denying everybody left and right for no reason. You know, so uh, some people who are absolutely eligible got denied and some people like the people calling never applied for DACA. But DACA is now available. So this is a program for kids who are brought into the United States under the age of 16 at a certain time. It's pretty restrictive. They had to have been here before June 2007. They had to have been here as of June 2012 when this law was enacted by Obama. Uh, they have to have proof that they went to school here, like high school or GED, or went to the army or college, you know, and uh, never been, you know, arrested for anything major. And they have to prove th their physical presence. So it's not just like some words that you have to prove. You actually have to have documents mm -hmm. to prove you were here physically in 2007, for many people who were brought here as little kids, it's a problem. What kind of documents can you have to prove a kid was here? Other than the kid was enrolled in school or went to get vaccines, you know, to the doctor, to the pediatrician. Not everybody came here and had that kind of family that did that for them. Some people, like the person that I represented and got denied, his family here was afraid to put him in school. They thought that he was going to be deported. So the poor kid came here when he was like 13. They put him to work in a construction company. He never went to school here. Like I forced him to go and get the GD and he did it, but that only satisfied the requirement of having to prove you went to school here. The physical presence part, that you had to be physically here in 2007, he couldn't prove because he was a kid and they didn't put him in school. We got his dental records, but for some reason the government didn't think they were convincing. You know, so okay, so all those still people, there. I can literally schedule them for the next week. They can, they can, they can have a regular consultation with you, and they can start the process immediately, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Wonderful. 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 Okay, and let's uh, you know a couple of final points of our of our show, unless you have something to talk about. The first one I'm going to talk about. The second one you as usually. First one is. Uh, we're doing this show for pretty large audiences, but for your individual issues, your individual problems, please call me directly. Call our office, which is 718-769-6352. Yes, it's 718-769-6352. I will schedule you a consultation with Marina, one-on-one -on -one consultation. You need to speak to the attorney about your particular issues. You can we can share a lot of information here and i understand some of them is very helpful to you but for your individual case do this appointment and the second one i want Maria to talk about it because again this week we had something when people are filing up their papers using paralegals or even worse their relatives friends their cousins their uncles their nephews who just graduating from college just because they can write in english they think they can fill out the form and you know what we're getting into literally daily with people who are coming with, with refusals and who are paying yeah. extra money. If you could talk a little bit about it. 
I'll just give you an example that actually doesn't even have to do anything with immigration law, but demonstrates mm -hmm. this point. A uh, lady called, very educated lady, uh, she even has, she emails me from work, so she has like MS next to her name, which means she has a master's of science in something. She's getting divorced. Mm -hmm. She actually finished her divorce, and um, her former spouse in their divorce uh, agreed to give her a portion of his pension, right? So there's a special uh, law about that and a special, special separate order has to be signed by the court. And then if you work for a bank like Bank of America or, uh, you know, or your company has their, your retirement plans for Bank of America, they write you back. They say, this is our procedure, send us this, this and the other. So she thought she could handle it herself because she's a pretty smart lady, well-educated, obviously works, you know, with writing yeah. and stuff like that. Couldn't do it herself. So here is somebody with an American master's of science degree, American lady who got divorced and needed to complete some forms from her husband's employer about his pension so it could be transferred to her, a part of it in the divorce, mm -hmm. and couldn't do it. And she hired us to do this. So just to understand, even if you have a master's degree and you are English speaking, doesn't mean you understand divorce or immigration law or you can fill out some forms. And she said, well, I had a big fight with my uh, attorney. He didn't think that, um, it, you know, he thought that I should pay him separately to do this procedure because this is mm -hmm. something that the bank required that wasn't there before. And I said, this is so easy. I could just do it myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so don't do it yourself. Don't have some paralegal do it. If you don't want to work with us, that's okay. We have a lot of good colleagues. I'm in this, uh, you know, Russian-speaking group, immigration group that has a lot of my colleagues that I really like and I would refer to, and I get nothing for it. I just think that people should go to somebody who knows what they're doing, even if they don't go to me. But please, have an attorney who knows what they're doing. Actually, even use an attorney who knows exactly the special kind of case that you have. Don't just have, you know, somebody who does work visas do your asylum case. You know, don't have somebody who knows asylum do your VAWA case because they don't know how to do VAWA. You know, we do so many VAWAs and so much asylum that I can do it with my eyes closed and I know exactly the trigger um, information that goes on the forms. I know what to put in the statement and I'm not making it up, but that will help you edit your story, you know, in such a way that even the facts that you have will be winning facts you know so that's my little message and we always say okay. this but i think it bears repeating very very much so and then at the end of the show first of all my compliments on, the, on your new computer we did not have a single glitch today it was smooth and perfect and let's talk just a little bit about our health adventure i had a terrible 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 week i had a back problem that i took a lot of painkillers and I didn't work out for three days. I ate over 1,500 calories daily when I didn't work out because I took the medication, so I found the excuse. I did not weight myself, so I don't know if I gained or lost. And I uh, only started to get back to normal um, last Wednesday, I mean, two days ago. On Wednesday, I started to walk again, and uh, Thursday I walk, and today I walk. And I'm trying to, but it's so hard right now. It's cold outside. I'm hungry. And uh, uh, one of the worst period of my of me dieting and being on a health journey, honestly. <laughs> I feel very similar to you. This was a snow, uh, a snow week. Yeah. I live in, in the suburbs of New Jersey. We got a lot more snow than people did in New York City. So I had trouble even leaving my house for the last few days. Today is, is better. Um, of course, I was home, working from home. My kids are here. They're constantly baking and cooking something. They're constantly hungry, so I end up being constantly hungry with them. Also, you know, in your home, you go to the fridge all the time. Um, I didn't have that much uh, working out until today. Today I got back doing my yoga, and I have tomorrow yoga and Sunday. So I'll do my three classes. Uh, generally, yoga, although it's probably not going to help so much with weight loss, it keeps me really uh, healthy mentally. And even though maybe I'm not losing that much, my body is kind of slimming down. 
and getting more, you know, like athletic and I can do so much more. I, my neck doesn't hurt anymore. I used to live with pain every day. So my neck doesn't hurt anymore. I have a lot less headaches, although I still get them, but a lot less. Um, and generally I feel much better about myself. So, um, but in terms of food, we are still pretty much sticking with mostly like low carb, you know, mm -hmm. and it's not really what we eat as much as how much we eat right now especially when we're home, but I'm not depressed. It's fine. Uh, I started watching the show called 90 day fiance since, uh, look, I, I don't watch TV. I don't have time. I'm always either working with my kid doing something or okay. reading. I'm not really a TV watcher, but I fell into this program and I've become addicted to it. It's, it used to be on the, I don't know if it still is on the learning channel. We get it on Hulu and streaming. So we started watching 90 day fiance. My family is screaming that I should be a consultant on that show because you know we do a lot of fiance visas. We have a couple of right course. now in the works. I think it's really funny because we get to talk to them for a little bit. We don't get to see their lives. And this show shows us their lives, like people get engaged, the kind of people that find uh, love overseas, how people are so brave. They need somebody from Morocco. And they go to Morocco. It's like this woman on the show, is, her name is Nicole. She went to Morocco, left her baby with her mom for five weeks to meet some guy that she's never, never met before. I would be scared out of my mind to go to a Muslim, like a pretty strict conservative Muslim country like that, you know, without like leaving my family and kids behind. They would have no access or contact with me. She like spent uh, like a few weeks over there. It wasn't for like a day that she went. Someone is. They did things in the desert together, and and then she came back, and uh, you know, it was, it, it was obvious the guy had like no feelings for her, except he really just wanted a green card. And what's funny to me is in these shows, you know what? These people don't lie. They are not to come to America. I really want a green card. I want to come to America and live in America. And by the way, yes, I know I have to live with you for a couple of years <laughs> to get that green card. Like some of these people don't even hide the fact that they're only coming to America for the green card. And what blows me away is that the US citizen is like, okay, fine, I'll let you. I, this so, show is very funny to me, very funny. So, so let, me, let, me, let me do my own. If you haven't watched it, let me do my own advertising. Uh, the cartoon that I watched with my son this week. I don't know if you watch your hand. Have to watch it with your family. The Soul. It's on Disney Plus. I had ordered Disney Plus for fifteen dollars. I, uh, which I would never. Oh order yeah, otherwise. I heard you have to it's watch. A it. cartoon, right? Yes, you have to watch it. I mean, literally, it's all. We're gonna watch. My, my, my husband went on a trip, yeah. so we're gonna watch. Please, you can't. I mean, it was, it was all the Nima finding Nima for me was always number one, and then the Toy Story, and then the Shrek. Uh, and uh, but this cartoon changed something in me. I really want you to watch, especially with kids together, smart, intellectual, funny, everything is in there. Well, I hear it's really good for older kids, yeah, yeah on the yeah. Disney Channel. Okay, yeah, absolutely. we'll give it a watch. Thank you so yeah. much, everyone. Thank have a you. great weekend. I think there's another snowstorm in our area coming. So enjoy your time with your family. Try to be safe. Uh, I hope you don't get sick. You know, I hope you don't get a cold. And obviously, I hope you don't get COVID. And if you do, that it's super, you know, um, yeah. easy for you. Um, we had somebody sick in our office recently. And thank God, because she's a young, healthy girl. She just, you know, had a fever for a day or two. And she's fine. So I hope that all of you... Stay safe and healthy. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next week.